I think we can start and uh, let me welcome everybody uh, and really thank particularly all my uh, colleagues, friends and participants here. I think because of you only that we get excited and we will continue these activities. So I am greatly thankful to all of you to spare your time and uh, be with us today. Uh, of course, uh, two of my very dear friends and senior colleagues are going to speak today. And uh, Professor Marwa will be introducing them very soon. I wish to mention that uh, this is a platform that uh, is uh, fundamentally a platform uh, of Association of Asia Scholars. Uh, perhaps you can see the banner behind me. Uh, this is uh, a, an alumni organization which uh, registered itself uh, as a society uh, in 2005. And five years later, in January of 2010, and that again you will see in my banner, we started a journal called Millennial Asia. So we have uh, this Association of Asia Scholars and if you can see there is a address of our website in my banner, uh, in my backdrop. I would encourage if you ever have about uh, even four to five minutes with you, just look at our website and we'll most uh, keenly encourage all of you to also indulge us with a a sage published uh, Millennial Asia journal. In fact, uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor Lakhvinder Singh, uh, has already advertised the next issue to be on COVID 19 and what it is doing to Asia and the world. Uh, so maybe you may like to also contribute there and get in touch with him. Uh, so I think it's fundamentally uh, that we are trying to now follow uh, the norm of going online and engaging with colleagues as we used to do. Uh, Association of Asia Scholar has done several conferences over the last 15 years as uh, uh, great publications out of these. Uh, but now I think we are adopting this new platform and we are also learning how to maximize to stay in touch with the, at least we have about 300 plus members across Asia. And we are looking for more and more friends and colleagues to join us. Uh, so we will look for your indulgence, both of my very senior colleagues today who are making a presentation on a very interesting topic, but also all the participants, uh, because because of you is, is how we will continue. So please continue with us. Uh, we have a Wednesday webinar, most likely every time on 11.30, but uh, sometime when we have speakers from the United States, we may have to accommodate because that will be middle of night for them. So we might shift time once in a while, but usually at 11.30. Thank you very much and uh, over to Dr. Reena Mava, who's chairing and moderating today's discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor Swaran Singh and thank you, Professor Kamal Shield, Professor Srimati uh, for joining us today and consenting to deliver the uh, lectures on the topic of China's nationalism and its dilemma. Uh, to briefly introduce our speakers, uh, both are uh, highly distinguished uh, in their fields of Chinese studies. Professor Kamal Shiel is a former professor of Chinese studies at the Banaras Hindu University. And uh, he has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. He is the author of several books, including Peasant Society and Marxist Intellectuals in China, which was published from Princeton. He's co-author of 13 Months in China and OUP publication. He served also as the editor for India on the Silk Road from local to global uh, papers in Asian history and culture and an encyclopedia of India-China cultural contact. Professor Srimati Chakrabarti also needs no introduction. She is the editor of the very popular journal, Sage Journal, China Report. She was previously the Dean of Social Sciences at the University of Delhi. She also received her PhD from the US in Political Science from Columbia University. She has master's degrees, double master's from Delhi University as well as Harvard and in Regional Studies of uh, East Asia. Uh, the prestigious China-India Friendship Award was conferred upon her in 2010. And uh, her latest books, besides several other publications, uh, include uh, the 2018 volume on higher education in India and China Select uh, Perspectives. So, so with this introduction of our uh, speakers for the day, may I please request Professor Kamal Shiel 
to kindly uh, speak about uh, China's nationalism uh, in the past, uh, you know, in the earlier days, the Me Force movement and uh, uh, what it was. And of course, then Professor Srimati will focus more on China's present nationalism for about 20 minutes. And then uh, we'll open the floor for question and answers. A few questions have already come in from participants. Uh, but we look forward to a lot more face-to-face uh, -face engagement uh, with our speakers for the day. So thank you very much to each one of you for joining us today. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you together with us this morning on Wednesday. So every Wednesday webinar, even for June, as uh, Professor Swaran Singh mentioned, we have international speakers now in the month of June, every Wednesday morning. Yes, so Professor Kamal Shil, may I request you to please uh, begin your presentation. So far, you know, good morning, everybody. And I'd like to thank, you know, Swan Singh and Rina Marwa for introducing me to this very, you know, exciting and interesting, you know, concept of bringing together from different parts and uh, having discussions on relevant issues. And uh, today I'd like to share some ideas on nationalism and its dilemma, uh, which uh, uh, are, you know, uh, uh, being once again discussed in contemporary China and part of, you know, China's debate on uh, uh, reconfig uh, reconfiguring nationalism and modernity. So, uh, like I've been given, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, I hope. So I'll just, in brief, give uh, uh, like a short statement on what uh, I feel that uh, should be taken for uh, understanding, you know, uh, modern Chinese nationalism. So I begin that uh, from around the late 19th century, combination of the Western and Japanese imperialist forces had begun to terri terribly weaken the basis of China as a civilizational state. Traditional ideas and practices seem inadequate to tackle the contemporary crisis and save China. China required a strong nation state to defend itself under such a situation, the urgency to strengthen the country and save China became the paramount concern of Chinese intellectuals. The question was how to reconcile the traditional cultural and universal civilizational state with modern national and particularistic nation state. What should constitute the ideology of nationalism? and its concomitant promise of modernity in the particular context of China. How to make political and cultural authorities congruent. So thus began the discourse of nationalism and modernity in China. This discourse reached a definitive stage during the May 4th movement. May 4th's anti-traditionalism and anti-imperialism promoted an ideology of nationalism that appeared to have provided answers to the contemporary crisis in China. Its anti-traditionalism evinced a vehement rejection of Confucianism and feudalism. Through a complete rupture with the past, it sought to promote enlightenment of ideas of modernity and cosmopolitanism. Its anti-imperialism featured in adoption of Marxism that presented a critique of both the tradition and Western liberalism. So this anti-feudal and anti-imperialist nationalism of Mayfort was adopted by the CCP, overwhelmed other ideologies of nationalism in modern China, and configured 
a kind of mass nationalism that successfully galvanized both intellectuals and masses to ultimately build a modern nation state. So wide and far reaching has been its influence that the performance and failings of the state are still uh, measured by its mirrored vision and promised goal. The May 4th undoubtedly reverberates the polity and society of contemporary China. It has therefore been lauded and represented as the dividing line between tradition and modern and a watershed in Chinese nationalism. Yet, the May 4th, as the Vera Schwartz and other scholars have demonstrated, also had some fault lines that provided space for alternative discourses of nationalism that revolved around the basic dilemma of preserving the core values and the spirit of civilization with its tradition and empire while following the agenda of nationalism and the pursuit of modernity and progress, providing different views of the nation uh, these nation views, nation escape, or national imagery, Dwara has argued that these are you know, shaped by histories, institutions, and expectations, and events national interest and its power structure at different moments. This imaginary can be integrative or contentious, leading even to separate separatist forces and play a role in periodically restructuring the goal and the strategy of nation state. These discourses have not only continued to exist, but have also been carefully raised in different times to tackle various dilemmas and predicaments that had been left unresolved by the May 4th and in making of the shift from a civilizational state to a nation state. Dismissed earlier for their nativism, uh, conservatism, or traditionalism, they continue to aggrandize or humble uh, state's vision and goal. Their contestation have rendered their status and nature of enlightenment, civilization, tradition, culture, nationalism, and modernity problematic. Such tensions and contestations in the construction of a dominant ideology for nation building do not suggest an end to historical project of enlightenment and modernity, but the continuity of the appearance and reappearance of the May 4th-like aspirations until the achievement of politically and culturally congruent nationalist goals in an undefined future. Looking at these recalled or represented alternative discourses provide some sense and meaning to contemporary manifestation of nationalism in China. To be sure, with its uh, growing strength and developing confidence, the Chinese state is now getting more actively engaged in creating an alternative discourse of modernity and nationalism to tackle the dilemma and predicament inherent in the limitation of the May 4th nationalism. Exhortation for building society with Chinese characteristics erecting a harmonious society, pursuit of the Chinese dream, and many other such slogans and guidelines carry potent ideas that can mean anything. But common in all is a strong drive to go back to the roots and configure and assert a Chinese identity. To pursue the goal of projecting a strong nation with Chinese characteristics, a concerted uh, 
pursuit for re-enlivening or redeeming historically available modes of networks, identities, and linkages is being more and more made to compete with the challenge from the West. They are being justified through such ideological constructs as new Confucianism, new nationalism, new humanism, which are bandied about to legitimize deviation from the May 4th spirit. In this context, it is interesting to examine the spirit of those ideologies that originated after the crisis posed by imperialism and competing nationalism and unity, and which are now getting rejuvenated with tacit support of the state and intellectual. Here I take for an example ideas of Kang Yuwei and Chou Zoran, who are now part of new intellectual debates in China. Kang Yuwei, in the genealogy of India, ideologues of modern Chinese nationalism, Kang Yuwei stands among the first of the intellectual modernizers to promote Confucianism-inspired modernity to save and strengthen China. A radical ideology in its own time, it was pushed back after the collapse of the Qing to the category of conservative nationalism. Yet, his promotion of the spatial characteristics of China in framing the blueprint of its modernity and the vehement rejection of enlightenment-based nationalism put him among the intellectuals in the schema of new Confucian, new nationalism in contemporary China. Kang retorted strongly to his disciple Liang Qichao's adulation of the European model of nationalism. Why should we vary of following European model for China. Tan answers that the major difference between European and Asian historical experiences make the formal unsuitable for China. Their histories followed different trajectories than those of Asian countries. The historical process of their rise to a system of modern statehood is still obscure. Further, in spite of a history of more than 1,000 years, well-demarcated national boundaries and completely separate national identity, these 10 or so European states are engaged in perpetual rivalry and constant warfare with each other. They follow an ideology that is tuned to conflict and war and to the continuous production of more and more upgraded arms and ammunition. This is what keeps them always full of vigor and an alert mood. So for Kang, the European model that threatened division of China into independent provinces and sought to build ethnic majority-based nation state is comforting to his idea of unity, peace, and harmony. This had potential to destruct the hybrid empire and civilization that developed over a long period of time. In late 19th and early 20th century, debates on the identity and reinvention of China, Khan strongly opposed talk of establishing a Han Center China, an effort he viewed as ignoring the new re reality of multi-ethnic state. The Qing government should instead foster a strong national identity by bringing together all ethnic groups within one single state to be named as a state of China. This should be done because Han Chinese, Manchus, Mongols, Muslim, and Tibetans or all Chinese without any distinction and all belong to a single state. The strength of hybrid Chinese empire state 
lies in its multi-ethnicity. Building a multi-ethnic national state of China, Kang Rai would provide a strong multi-ethnic army with enough strength to counter threats from abroad. Our China, he writes, if mobilized troops of Miao and Kan Su Hui race, fierce valiant warriors of two armies, along with those from Jiangsu, Chechang, Sichuan, Guangdong, who are rich in wisdom and intelligence skills. The trained militia would have the strength of more than 20 million. With a financial resource of at least 7 billion, we can expand within a few years our knowledge of the world through translations of books and further studies. There is no way that China can perish. So while he admired flourishing development mm, in science and philosophy in Europe, traditional Confucian society was still more beneficial for the people in China. This was primarily because China belonged to Asia and the Asian race. Its politics and culture are like Asian countries. She can therefore only be compared with such big and old civilized Asian countries like India, Persia, and Turkey, which in terms of richness of history and culture are akin to China. So in order to build a strong state, he said that it is necessary to strengthen the Qing state whose scenic characteristic could hardly be doubted. Also an invigorated effort by intellectual is necessary to save the hybridity, hybridity of Chinese empire. So, so the path for the modernity and progress must be found within Chinese historical experiences. Intellectuals need to rise and protect the unity of China and ward off all attempts for its fragmentation of China, as well as creation of Western or European style, small nation state. Khan thus articulates a vision of nationhood and an agenda for modernity and enlightenment, enlightenment that were indigenous. It was based on context other than the capitalist West and was imagined in self-other relationships, that is, a set of space, language, belief, and history that was self or ours against a despised and external other. So as such, uh, Wang Hui, he uh, remarks that uh, can't discuss such questions as China, Han ethnicity, and Chinese culture in terms of hybridity, attempting to use this view of hybrid China to resist European style ethnic nationalism and to form a capacious Chinese identity. To a great extent, such beliefs of Kang have been privileged by mainland New Confucian, whose basic orientation pertained to the construction of new nation and state in the framework of a reconstructed Confucianism. In fact, getting confident with the rise of wealth and power and developing fear and anxiety over rising indignation among the people at the incomplete process of West-inspired modernity the state legitimized new Confucianism as a powerful alternative source of knowledge by 1980. Its agenda focused on the reconstruction of a national spirit, the establishment of moral values, the organization of ethical order, the formation of educational principles, forging of a common value system, cohesion of nation states, and further promotion of cultural and ethnic travel as reconfirmation of their larger activist vision uh, of political Confucianism as national, as national religion. So Khan resolution on maintaining border sovereignty and people thus overwhelms reasons and goals 
of the Mayapur nationalism, replacing individual and class with the state and people is the basic characteristic of new generation ideological discourse whose goal is the China dream. This is a return to the central question of the modern era, a return to Confucian ideas, a new understanding of the CCP, original intent in founding the party to save China. So Khan is thus once again prominently in picture in attempt to configure contemporary China. Another example is uh, from the works of a, a maverick intellectual writer, Chou So Ren. Chou So Ren is known for his eclectic things. He was the younger brother of Chou, once held cultural hero. He was later scorned by Mao as cultural traitor and denounced for his alleged bourgeois or capitalist mentality during the Cultural Revolution. He suffered a tragic death under the hands of young Red, young Red Guards in 1967 at the age of 82. Chou, Chou's writing resurfaced in 1980 and have since then been presented as counter model to the Chinese, uh, to the Mayfoot mainstream ideas and practices. Like the first generation of late Qin modernizer Kang Wei, Chou too was not very sanguine about the Western modern of nationalism and modernity. He detested revolutionary and other such ideologies that profess complete rejection of tradition to bring about modernity. Instead, he promoted individual autonomy and exploration of scientific reason in traditional practices. Uh, so, in fact, being wary of the Mayfoot intellectual self-inflicted sense of inferiority that grew out of their realization of the innate weakness of Chinese tradition and civilization, Cho demonstrated the critical temper, mature status, and modernizing traits that were product of the Ming and Song modernity and that which contained original seeds for the growth of powerful, flourishing China. Cho, like Khan, opposed the rejection of tradition that the May 4th mainstream ideology of nationalism had proposed and favored the dynamism and vitality of the flourishing local wisdom to configure or reconfigure. But like uh, what I had been talking about, you know, that alternative discourses of nationalism, which emerged during the period of uh, a pre-liberation you know, period in China, are coming back and they are being utilized in a new shape through by by being given you know new uh, identities and uh, in doing so you know like uh, you have uh, one hand uh, uh, this ideas of Kangyo Wei that is you know more state centric and the idea of Chou uh, Soren which is more society centric which you know uh, like to take you know a state uh, on the task for not completing the ideals on which you know nationalism uh, uh, idea was based, and uh, to sum up, you know the last uh, few paragraphs, he chose concerns and anxieties are in many ways similar to thoughts of many of contemporary intellectuals of the colonized nation who were wary of nationalism and search for alternative responses to modernity. In his larger pursuit, one in fact discerns strong strains of Gandhi and Tagore's disdain for political nation state based on West-inspired notion of nationalism and modernity. 
So one point, you know, like uh, there was a question about similarities between uh, Chinese and Indian nationalism. So like in Cho's uh, thing, one finds, you know, like a strong uh, strains of Gandhi and Tagore's nationalism. And uh, it is doubtful that Gandhi or Tagore may have interacted with Cho or had, you know, mm, any common source of education and knowledge. What was sure that they all feared the result of encompassing a civilization into a nation. That how could you know, put diversity, hybridity of a civilization into the framework of a nation? So their agenda of modernity instead of strive to restore the moral basis of the society that thrive not in the atmosphere of violence but in harmony and peace. Actually, Cho was, uh, Cho rejected, you know, violence me. He was, you know, very much against, uh, that he uh, criticized Lu Xun, you know, his brother, for making uh, violence, you know, as the prime uh, force to get, you know, uh, get into modernity. So contemporary Chinese intellectuals now valorize chose focus on individual liberty and defiance to overwhelming pressure of anti-traditional revolutionary ideology. And they say they found in his writing an intense yearning for freedom, liberty, and modernity that characterized the May 4th spirit. And also on the other, a strong distrust in May 4th ministry or consensus ideology that were brought forward to achieve that. It is this irony that appealed contemporary intellectuals to voice their own anxiety when confronted with the present social, political, and moral dilemmas and predicaments. And it is in this context that Chao, uh, Cho's life and work have now been subject to many interesting <coughs> new studies. So concluding this, what is uh, evident in the contemporary rise of these new voices is a deviation from the May 4th ideals and vision um, with increasing tension between narratives of modernity and nationalism. Old voices are being revived, promoted, and carefully adopted to project the powerful appeal of the success story of Chinese characteristics and allay fears and anxieties that the contemporary developments have produced. And uh, mm, the, mm, uh, the, these alternative voices from the May 4th era may assuage the tension arising out of the mounting irreconcilable difference between the state and society. It is our, however certain that these uh, dilemma of enlightenment inspired modernity and nationalism may inaugurate a new form of modernity sourced less from the West and based more on Chinese historical experience. This is how I end. So uh, I think Professor Kamal Sheel uh, gave us uh, a, a wonderful sort of backdrop to the topic of today's uh, discussions and he spoke about the May 4th movement uh, during which radicals and revolutionaries actually got a sense of purpose and uh, direction uh, and that was that uh, you know there should be the destruction of foreign imperialism and that was going to be the first stage in the birth of uh, china again as a nation so he really spoke about um, you know the anti-imperialistic and anti-feudal uh, movement of may 4th which helped to galvanized people from cro different cross sections. And uh, he also compared it uh, with uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, philosophy and his uh, ideology of European uh, nationalism. So uh, with these words, uh, may I request Professor uh, Srimati to please uh, unmute yourself, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I start, let me thank uh, the AS and uh, in particular Dr. Reena Marwa for inviting me to come and speak and uh, I feel very privileged 
about that and uh, i feel honored that i am you know in the same panel as uh, uh, with a scholar of the repute of professor kamal sheer okay now nationalism nationalism is essentially a western construct you know this is very well known it was only with the disintegration of the holy roman empire in europe that nation states emerged and nationalism as a uh, belief system also emerged along with it classical marxism has no place for nationalism it upholds internationalism and in the writings of marx and engels we find that they talk a lot about the vices of nationalism uh, and uh, mainly saying that uh, nationalism is something or the nation state is something which divides the people it divides the proletariat and it is to the advantage of the bourgeoisie and therefore uh, marx's famous slogan workers of the world unite now nationalist sentiments in china became visible for the first time uh, after the defeat of the chinese at the hands of great britain in the opium war uh, soon after the opium war the treaty of nanjing was signed where uh, there were uh, which included provisions which were very humiliating for china and with it began the so called self strengthening movement of 1868 and it continued uh, till about 1895 during this movement the main uh, argument or the main uh, debate uh, amongst intellectuals the court intellectuals was about what path china should follow professor kamal shil talked about it briefly uh, the thi yong debate emerged during this period and what is thi yong uh, the common belief was that or the accepted belief was that whatever china does it should uh, modernize uh, with the china chinese culture as its base so in essence it whatever the modern whatever form modernization comes it, in essence it should be chinese and in form it can be western now the self strengthening movement of course uh, withered away with the defeat of china at the hands of japan in 1895 the first uh, sino japanese war and uh, Uh, when uh, taiwan was lost to uh, japan ne next sunyat sen comes on the scene and he uses nationalism to attack the manchus the qing dynasty because yeah, the manchus he said are uh, a minority they i mean they are not hans so they can't protect the interest of china so they are foreigners and therefore uh, we must get rid of the manchu dynasty and he got lot of support over this that and he also supported self determination of the Uh, ethnic groups for a while but of course gave it up later mao also found nationalism very handy particularly during the sino japanese war of 1937-45 he mobilized the peasants using the rhetoric of nationalism and that's how he got an upper hand and that's how the communist party gained popularity of course they did make more sacrifices than the kmt there is no doubt about that but they used nationalism as a tool that here is japan is trying to destroy china it's coming into china and the peasants were uh, you know aroused by this and uh, all this i'm not going into the details all this is very well documented in uh, professor chamus johnson's very well known book peasant nationalism and communist power in the post liberation era uh, we find the domination of marxist leninist ideology in the early years i mean during the maoist era especially the dominance of marxist leninist ideology and though nationalism was not abandoned it was very much there but it was submerged within the ideology of marxism leninism there was enough reason for the chinese to propagate nationalism or promote nationalism but they did not quite do so the reasons why i'm saying that they had enough reason because soon after liberation uh, the korean war started china participated very very intensely lost many of its soldiers even mao's own son was there then the chinese belief that there is a nuclear threat from the united states was very strong they dug tunnels all over china to ensure that uh, the nuclear war at least save some people in fact during this time mao said that even if the americans destroy china or just the world uh, some chinese will be there to build socialism so uh, it is it is only capitalism and imperialism that will die in the event of a nuclear war but socialism will survive and in 1958 there's this taiwan threats crisis where also united states is the target 
And interestingly, during this period, Japan is not so much of a target. Mao's famous uh, speech, American imperialism is a paper tiger, again, using Marxist jargon, that it is a fight between imperialism and the people of the world. Uh, China and US, these terms are not used during this period. And being part of the Soviet bloc and as a close ally of the Soviet Union during this period, it was internationalism which dominated the discourse. Now, in the decade of the 60s, almost complete stress on Marxism-Leninism. Now, why I say this? Take the 1962 India-China border war. Now, China could have expressed many of its, uh, uh, you know, uh, opposition to India uh, using nationalist sentiments, but that was not done. In fact, not only that, you know, there is very little discussion and talk about uh, this war. Uh, I uh, went through, uh, you know, all the issues of Beijing Review from 1959 to 1964, and I also used some Chinese, uh, uh, you know, language material which were tra in translation for my research on um, um, the Maoist movement in India to see how the war was projected to the Chinese. And I found to my surprise that very little was mentioned. In fact, uh, uh, there were just tiny news items here and there. Uh, Indian expansion is pushed back. India acting uh, at the behest of its uh, imperialist masters, United States and United Kingdom. Chinese teaching a good lesson to them. But all of this was very, very uh, limited. Uh, and remember, China was going through a bad time during this war. You know, the after effects of the Great Leap Forward were very much there. But somehow we don't see much of nationalist rhetoric. And uh, this is confirmed. I confirmed this when I went to China in 1992. I was uh, very, very surprised to find that most Chinese, educated Chinese, did not know that there was a border war. There was a war between India and China. In India, it was such a big event. It changed our history. But in China, even scholars of international relations did not know that there was a war between India and China in 1960. Now, of course, many of them know. But at that point, there was no awareness of that. Okay, now, uh, in this period, in the late 60s, mid 60s, relations with the Soviet Union uh, strained, but here also the jargon of Marxism Leninism was used to attack the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has gone revisionist, they are capitalist holders. In China also, they have supporters, they have uh, converted the Soviet Union into uh, more like a, a capitalist bourgeois system. It is hardly communist, it is hardly moving towards socialism. China is the only country that is. Uh, following the path of socialism, and therefore China is the leader of the socialist movement. Now in the mid-60s also, we find that the Chinese model of revolution is being propagated by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it was mainly through Lin Piao, you know, that started with Lin Piao's famous essay, Long Live the Victory of the People's War, where Lin Piao said that the Chinese revolutionary model is applicable to the countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Eventually, they upheld this uh, position and that is how so many um, Maoist movements emerged all over the world, including our own Naxalite movement in the mid-1960s. So the super dominance of ideology in the Mao era uh, continued till Mao's death. However, in the Maoist era, we also see strains of cultural nationalism vis-a-vis -vis the minorities. But that too was woven in Marxist-Leninist rhetoric. For example, well, Mao of course said that he was opposed to great Han chauvinism, but uh, he said that in his writings, but during the Cultural Revolution, when the minorities were attacked, left, right, and center by the Red Guards, the, slogans were, was, the slogan was that they are attacked because they believe, uh, because they follow the four olds. The four olds being old belief, old habit, old culture, and old customs. And this was also interpreted as uh, feudalism. Basically, they are feudal in nature, and uh, they are not moving towards the path of socialism, and therefore, uh, you know, they have to be uh, rectified. These have to be rectified. In the Tang Xiaoping Chiang Zemin era, ideology of Marxism Leninism gradually loses its steam as a result of the reforms and opening up. Uh, gradually, that gave way to the emergence, or rather, the re emergence of nationalism. The essence of all the discussions and debates and discourse that we see were quite similar to that of the self strengthening movement. That, that, that how much of it should be Chinese, how much should be Western, the slogan, rich country, strong army, which was, you know, adopted during that time, was also uh, often mentioned. Uh, restoring Confucius became a part of uh, 
the uh, policy of the state and the um, party. Professor Kamal Shil uh, mentioned it. Now, the absence of a powerful dominant ideology gave way to nationalism, which came very handy to the rulers. Nationalism was, uh, however, was rather benign. And this is during Tang Xiaoping, during the Tang Xiaoping Chiang Zemin era. And this can be very well seen in this very famous quote of Chiang Xia, Tang Xiaoping, where he says, you know, he was probably addressing foreign policy um, cadres. He says, uh, observe calmly, secure our position, cope with affairs calmly, hide our capacities and bide our time. Be good at maintaining a low profile and never claim leadership. Now, nationalism uh, overtakes ideology during this period, but it is not an aggressive uh, nationalism. Now, within China in the 80s also, there were fierce debates uh, about China's path to modernization because very fast, and the changes were coming very fast. A uh, lot of uh, young people were following Western lifestyle. So as a reaction, there was this campaign against spiritual pollution, uh, where Western ideas, Western beliefs, you know, were all criticized. And uh, this was obviously state-sponsored. Uh, okay, now countering this came another wave of writings, you know, on the weakness of Chinese culture. Now, this was demonstrated very well by a six-part television serial called Her Sham, which in English translates as River Elegy. Can I be heard? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, right. Translates as River Elegy. And it was quite popular among people, but rather controversial among intellectuals because this serial was actually saying that uh, China is backward, China is inward looking, and this is not going to help us uh, in our uh, path for development. Uh, something else has to be tried. Uh, however, many people say that the people who made River Elegy or were critical of Chinese culture were actually more nationalist because they were wanting China to come out of uh, all that. Now, 1989 is Tiananmen, uh, where after that, you know, soon after the Tiananmen incident, there's widespread condemnation of China by the international community, mainly Western countries. Sanctions were imposed and China became very defensive. The state media uh, said that the upheaval was a conspiracy by the Western powers to disgrace China and sabotage its development uh, path, its development projects. During this time, there was uh, trouble in Tibet also and stability was stressed more than anything else, uh, stability and harmony. Now, in the 1990s, we see a little sharper turn towards nationalism. There were two reasons behind it. One was China lost the bid to host the 2000 Olympics. I think they lost it to Australia or something. And uh, uh, there was, uh, I was in China actually when the Olympic team came to uh, inspect and there was so much of excitement and uh, the whole uh, city of Beijing completely changed in its appearance. But anyway, China did not get it and there was a lot of anger and annoyance and uh, resentment against the Western powers. And the other event was, of course, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, which caused uh, some amount of nervousness amongst the Chinese. And they started talking about you know, China's superior system, superior socialist system. The Soviet Union had, uh, you know, they had earlier said that it has followed the revisionist path is no longer socialist. Now, uh, much of this grievance uh, uh, or resentment uh, or uh, I would say uh, semi-aggressive nationalism is reflected in this famous book that became very popular called China Can Say No. Uh, then we have the Belgrade bombings. Then there were protests all over China. Anti-American sentiments came out very strongly. And it was expressed in the media. It was expressed uh, on the streets of China. And of course, as I said, Confucianism during this period returned with a bang. Uh, the Hu Chintao era, is that where we hear of, or, you know, where Hu Jintao uh, upholds the idea of harmonious society and scientific development. Uh, there were uh, two incidents, however, that triggered uh, the arousing of nationalist sentiments in China. One was the demand for Taiwanese independence. Uh, the DPP had come to power in Taiwan and they were not, they did not believe in unification. 
and uh, there was almost a possibility that Taiwan may declare independence. Of course, that did not happen. Meanwhile, the Chinese reacted by passing the anti-secessionist law uh, through the National People's Congress. The other event that caused a lot of uh, resentment and a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, turmoil uh, in China, not turmoil, but a uh, lot of uh, open opposition uh, in favor of uh, nationalism was uh, Japanese Premier uh, uh, Koizumi's visit to the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo. Now, Yasukuni Shrine, as many of you will know, is a place where um, uh, many uh, people who died during World War II are buried, and the Chinese say that uh, many of them are war criminals. So, when the Japanese Premier goes to this place, he's actually honoring the war criminals, the one who had, uh, you know, uh, uh, been uh, have tortured and been atrocious towards Chinese. So this always is a very, very sensitive issue in China. And uh, it is believed that uh, this uh, movement, this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, arousing of nationalist feelings was sponsored by the state because it began with the damaging of uh, Japanese property. Many Japanese shops and establishments were attacked. In fact, uh, the Japanese government was also contemplating moving its businesses from China. That did not happen. I think that is what made the state act quickly and control this. So the state itself, which had initially provoked it, came and controlled it. And uh, because uh, a robust relationship with Japan is very important, both for China as well as Japan. However, uh, in the later period, uh, in the last uh, uh, phase of which Jintao's rule, two things were came in his favor, so the nationalist rhetoric was somewhat uh, balanced, somewhat subdued. One was the successful hosting of the 2008 Olympics, you know, where China got a lot of praise all over the world, and uh, the Chinese felt very proud about it, and China also was uh, the number one uh, country in the games, uh, won the maximum number of medals. And then uh, that was one, and then the other important thing in favor of uh, Hu Jintao was that China became the number two economic power, replacing Japan. Of course, in 2009, there were disturbances in Xinjiang, which was seen as an affront to stability and harmony, uh, but not too much of nationalist rhetoric is at least visible from whatever little I have read. Next is the Xi Jinping uh, era. The era is still continuing. I don't know when it will end, maybe not in my lifetime, but harmonious society, scientific development, disappeared and was replaced by China dream. The evidence uh, of aggressive Belgian nationalism is very much there uh, in the form of uh, uh, the whatever China, China's activities in the South China Sea, then the behavior towards Taiwan and Hong Kong, and what is happening in Ladakh, and more importantly, the uh, camps, the so-called uh, you know, re-education or what we call the detention camps in Xinjiang. These were very strong nationalistic measures that the Xi Jinping government has taken measures of, I would say, you know, these, these show that nationalism has uh, uh, come back very, very uh, strongly. And this is, uh, you know, this evidence of aggressive and belligerent nationalism uh, has, uh, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one is, of course, the deglobalization tendencies. Though China is pursuing nationalism, but it also wants globalization. The two are, you know, mutually contradictory. But then the Chinese have done so many, you know, in their entire history, we see so many contradictions. So without globalization, China may not be able to uh, pursue, say, its BRI. Then, of course, the U.S.-China trade war that created a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ill will on both sides, and the Chinese media was full of media and social media was full of attacks on the United States. Uh, and now, of course, with uh, COVID-19, the strong anti-China sentiments all over the world, it's global, and there will be a backlash uh, in China, definitely. And, and uh, more, we, will, we are likely to see uh, more uh, belligerent nationalism. Uh, the more secure the Chinese leadership, more aggressive will its nationalism be. So to sum it up quickly, we see that in the early phase in the Maoist era, uh, there is nationalism, but it comes in the garb of Marxism-Leninism. In the Tang Chiang era, you know, there's some kind of benign nationalism. It, uh, you know, it's used 
and and uh, remains uh, by the state and also remains subdued. Kuchintawira also more or less uh, we, we we see uh, sparks of nationalist sentiments. However, it is in the Xi Jinping era, Xi Jinping era that we see very very uh, uh, you know assertive, aggressive, and belligerent kind of nationalism. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, because you really took us all the way from, you know, 1838, 1840, from the opium wars right up to the present, to the Hu Jintao and to the uh, Xi Jinping era where, uh, and as you very rightly said, that the more secure China becomes, uh, the more belligerent uh, it becomes. And that also reminds me of uh, what Mao had said just before the Cultural Revolution. He had said, I love great upheavals. So those were upheavals within the country, but now we are seeing upheavals uh, in the entire uh, global uh, order. Uh, so we'll go forward with the uh, questions. Uh, I'll just uh, read out the questions that I have. Uh, from Rudra Bihu Bhattacharya, what is the main difference between China's nationalism and India's nationalism in the post-globalized world? And you uh, just, in fact, spoke about that. Uh, Professor Srimati, would you like to uh, say something about this? Uh, India's nationalism is, I would say, within India, relatively contested, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing, because uh, often we find that uh, nationalism in India, you know, especially in the contemporary period, is directed against, you know, our own people. Okay, whereas in China. Uh, even if uh, the national minorities have behaved uh, in the perceived in their perception in the wrong way, but they are uh, not ever directly attacked. It is said that it's feudalism and uh, no belief in socialism that is causing them to believe in this way. The, you know, their, their leaders or their uh, you know uh, their uh, so-called supporters abroad are attacked, but directly we don't see any attacks like that. Of course, I have not studied this subject, you know, in any depth, but this is my impression. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question that, uh, that do you think that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is a bigger threat to the United States? Bigger is it threat China to the United or is it Chinese Communist Party? Oh, okay. Now, China and the Chinese Communist Party at this point at least cannot be separated because uh, the Chinese Communist Party is very much, you know, in control. And uh, I don't know if the if China or the Chinese Communist Party at all are threats because whatever it is, uh, the United States is still way ahead of China and everything. They may have not have a very intelligent president now. Mm. But apart from that, I think, uh, you know, uh, people say that China will overtake uh, United States. Maybe in GDP, they may someday. But what about so many other things? So I don't really think there is a real threat. And if we believe that China is nationalist because of the Communist Party, then I think we are make, making a mistake. Even without the Communist Party, the Chinese people are very nationalist. And uh, the, the overseas Chinese, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, we find a lot of nationalist uh, sentiments among them. They don't want China to break or disunite, you know. And, uh, to say, and uh, so whether it is... Uh, you know, the Communist Party in power or not in power, mm -hmm. uh, even, a, you know, a non-Communist Party will actually, you know, be as much nationalist as the Communist Party, if not more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so we do have a few questions on the chat box, but I would encourage our participants to, uh, you know, raise their hands and then unmute themselves and then ask a question to our speakers. And we have... Uh, to people who have uh, raised their hands, yes, yes, please, uh, please give state your question, Subro. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Tomal Shil. It's all always the, reminds me the old lecture since I'm his student in BHU days. So I have a question to Professor Tomal Shil, sir. He, how do you define May Fourth nationalism and avant-garde avant -garde nationalism? Is this an alternative paradigm or alternative source of nationalism? What a May Fourth May Fourth nationalism is uh, uh, was uh, the most acceptable kind of nationalism at that particular time. 
Now, one should think that Chinese nationalism grew out of uh, a defensive posture. Like it was, you know, in order to save China, in order to save, you know, uh, 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 China from all the crisis. So at that time, the crisis was seen to be uh, coming out of the crumbling Confucian and uh, uh, feudal order. And on the other hand, by expanding uh, imperialist forces. So the West Western, you know, type of nationalism and enlightenment appealed, you know, Chinese intellectuals because it had, you know, uh, it was based on uh, rejection of both feudalism, especially, you know, in its Marxist uh, shape, rejection of uh, feudal order and Confucianism, as well as rejection of imperialism. And on the other hand, it's uh, modernity was based on uh, uh, promises of democracy and more, you know, mass participation in the running of the state. So that time, you know, uh, it was, you know, a kind of ideology that appealed and served the cause of uh, developing a mass nationalism. So, Rohan, please. Shall I go? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, my question is, uh, to Shri Ma'am or Chakravarti Ma'am regarding how you look at the maritime nationalism takes place in China in the future. Because we uh, maritime students always think that globalization truly resides in maritime domain. And have you, men you mentioned slightly about South China Sea, again East China Sea and their, in their interference in the Indian Ocean. So considering the Chinese growing nationalism and it depends growth on globalization and maritime domain. How you look at that uh, the nationalism take place in the maritime domain? Okay, well, uh, uh, you know, foreign policy is not my area and uh, on this issue also I have not done any research, but uh, this nationalism is going to increase because China now wants to become a global naval power. Because now, once they have achieved uh, major, uh, you know, uh, milestones in their, uh, in the development of their, uh, you know, army, now it is Navy that they are given, giving, uh, you know, uh, preference to, and uh, giving importance to rather. Uh, the Chinese cannot forget that it was Chiang He, you know, Chiang He's naval expedition that uh, made, uh, you know, China um, felt in other parts of the world. And uh, Chiang He was able to uh, uh, achieve many feats, which the Chinese uh, Navy, of course, uh, wants to exceed. And uh, with growing nationalism, you know, China's maritime nationalism will also, uh, you know, uh, go ahead and they will uh, be less hesitant to do things. You know, they, they have, uh, uh, of course, uh, never objected to, say, India's uh, right to, uh, you know, free navigation or any other country talking about that. But still, they have gone ahead with uh, the plans in South China Sea, in East China Sea. You know, they, they are uh, just ignoring, you know, the decision of the uh, United Nations uh, uh, Court of Justice you know, they've completely ignored, they've not even publicized it. So it is very clear that the Chinese want a stronger uh, presence in the oceans. That is very clear. But Professor Swaran Singh is, a, you know, an expert on foreign policy. I think he can, uh, you know, better answer this question. Uh, may I now uh, give the floor to Alpana? Alpana Varma, yes. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation, uh, professors. My question is to Professor Srimati Chakravati, ma'am. Uh, in a way, nationalism has always been about networks that Professor Kamal Shili mentioned in terms of mass nationalism. Uh, it has been always about realizing and mobilizing the imagined uh, 
ties between people for political purposes so with the coming of digital technologies how do you think what changes this has brought since you mentioned about social media we have also seen cases where in south african people have been uh, cornered in shanghai and due to the cases of xenophobia or we see the closing of confucius institute the last institute in sweden so how do you see these things impacting uh, nationalism back at home in china because such things come in social media so quickly that it impacts the image of a country uh, thoroughly like globally it impacts so how do you see what changes the digital technologies are bringing well you have worked in this area for four or five years or more and you probably uh, you know have some views on it but uh, definitely social media is going to enhance uh, you know this um, intense uh, nationalism because more and more people will be aware of what is happening around the world yeah. and social media is used by you know a lot of people including uh, strong supporters of the communist party and uh, there are also uh, people who are opposed to the communist party so uh, and whenever uh, uh, you know uh, tweet or a you know message which is actually not supportive of the party it is removed very soon but before it is removed many people see it so that will you know increase and in the next years you know i have a feeling that uh, that may uh, uh, you know cause some issues and uh, there may be a time when things will go out of hand maybe the state will have to even curb that kind of nationalism if things become normal in the next two or three years well people say that till the us elections this strong anti china feelings will continue all over the world because professor uh, sorry president trump wants it and uh, uh, in the later whether trump wins or loses uh, that will get subdued so in that period if the social media uh, opposition to uh, the west or to the united states if it appears to be going out of hand there is a possibility that the state will uh you know crack down on that there is also that possibility uh thank you alpana we have an, a question from dr vijay kumar yes please yeah thank you ma'am yeah yes. i have to yeah i have two questions uh be uh, brief so that we can yeah 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 sure sure chance. yeah yeah uh, yeah 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 sure yeah. sure thank you and uh, the questions are are uh, two question with professor chakravarti uh See, my first observation is that Chinese nationalism has been largely inclusive. It has included Chinese minorities among its own people, but still we find separatism in the minorities of Uyghur, China, uh, that is Xinjiang province, and among Tibetans. So, what factors could be uh, there? Means still they no, don't feel part of the national uh, frame, means uh, state. And second question is. uh chinese state has been authoritarian we all know chinese uh, there is no democracy and freedom but still uh, chinese state has not faced legitimacy crisis i would say uh, so what explains the uh, legitimacy of the chinese state among its own people yeah the other two questions thank you okay thank you very much uh well uh, the national minorities uh, resent khan domination that is very very clear okay. they you know in tibet in xinjiang and all these places okay. khan culture is being imposed so even if the state talks about you know uh, one nation of uh, a multi ethnic nation and all okay. these are things you know on the ground which affect people now if you tell xinjiang muslims that you can't grow a beard you can't wear a skull cap obviously okay. it will not be accepted easily so okay. the cultural freedom of these people is being uh, curtailed that, that is there is no doubt about that that okay. was much less in the earlier period it's much more now in the uh, xi ching period so therefore okay. there is opposition uh, yeah. although massive development has taken place both in tibet in xinjiang mongolia and all the minority areas but that has not uh, you know pleased the people to the extent that the chinese state or the party thought it would because right. uh, you know what people want is cultural free freedom and uh, over domination of the hans is not at all acceptable okay. so that is the reason why there is still uh, you know resentment in minority areas right, right. and uh, about your second question legitimacy well the answer is very easy there are two things that uh, has led to the legitimacy of the state and one is of course 
the betterment and the lives of the people. Hundreds of millions of people who lived in poverty are now very, very well off. Now, very few states have been able to do that. You know, the number of people that have been that have been pulled out of poverty in a matter of 30 years is uh, uh, phenomenal. Never has this, ha has this happened. And China's, you know, 10% uh, GDP growth over 30 years is again an another thing which is which has not happened, uh, you know, uh, anywhere else in the world. It's unprecedented. So people have got a better life. So obviously, why will they challenge a system which is giving them a good life, especially when they've seen their parents and grandparents suffer? So that is one reason. The other one is, you know, like Mao had said in 1949, that China has stood up. But China did not, did not stand up then really. China stood up after the reforms of Tang Xiaoping. You know, as I said, and as you all know, China became the number two uh, economic power. Of course, in the process, it, lost, it has lost a lot. You know, it was the most egalitarian society in 1978. By 2003, it became the most non-egalitarian society in the world. And it has, you know, problems of environmental degradation, corruption, uh, you know, uh, gender uh, issues. So many problems have emerged uh, as a result of this modernization. But since the overall standard of living of the people of China has been more than satisfactory for them. They perceive it as something that the Communist Party has given them, and the Communist Party is, you know, makes a lot of uh, you know noise about it also. So obviously, you know, there is no legitimacy crisis really. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we had some more questions. Lelufer, you had a question. Yeah, please unmute yourself from Dhaka, Professor of International Relations. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, such a arranging such a wonderful session. Uh, both of them um, are equally good. Um, but my question would be uh, regarding modern uh, nationalism in China to Professor Srimati Chakraborty. Uh, uh, one thing is that uh, when we, we you spoke about uh, the uh, you know rejection of uh, Olympics being held in China in 1990, uh, what is the connection between the Tiananmen? square incident and how this sort of you know uh, uh, led to a resurgence of nationalism inside as well as uh, creation of a different kind of image of china outside um, now you have said previously that you don't work on foreign policy related areas so i'd rather um, have you talk about you know internal um, you know resurgence of nationalism in china yeah thank you uh in 1990, 90, uh, well, the delegation uh, from the IOC visited China in 1992. And as far as I remember, uh, there was an interview of uh, the IOC chief. And he said that uh, we are not taking into account any, uh, you know, anything which has to do with the internal politics of China, which probably means that uh, the Tiananmen Square did not you know, matter to them. But it's hard to believe that you know, so soon within, you know, three or years of the Tiananmen incident, uh, that wouldn't have been at the back of their minds. But of course, when they gave their report, they probably said that uh, infrastructure was still not as good. Uh, there was still, uh, you know, the roads were not as good and quite a few, uh, you know, things they had uh, mentioned. So, you know, if you take them at face value, obviously it was not that. But then, as I said, you know, they, this uh, uh, 1989 Tiananmen must have uh, been on their minds because all of them were from Except I think, I don't remember the exact composition, except maybe two or three, the rest belong to the Western world. And even those who were in the non-Western world probably would, uh, you know, have that as a consideration. Now, what went on at the meeting when they decided, it was a closed door meeting when the IOC decided not to give China the uh, Olympics, uh, you know, we don't know. But, you know, hopefully someday we'll know. Uh, we have uh, Avni, uh, who's been uh, waiting for some time. Avni, would you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, my question is for uh, Srimati Ma'am. It has been said that China utilizes its, na as in, in order to uh, get together, every get the whole population together in order to promote its nationalism, it utilizes mm -hmm. the aspects of war. So when there is chaos inside China, so it utilizes the tool of nationalism at the time of war in order to bring people together. So do you think uh, that at the time of this pandemic, when China is increasing its defense budget, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the recent meeting in that also, uh, they have said that uh, they 
the future trajectory is going to be towards a war. So do they think that the chaos that was brought about by the pandemic, they're utilizing it again in order to have a war and bring the nationalism again on an upward trajectory in time? Okay, I, I don't think uh, China will uh, want to go for a war. Much of it is public posturing, telling its people that, you know, we are ready and if there's a war, we will fight back. But uh, at this stage, uh, neither China nor any other country, I would say, would want to have a military confrontation because the costs will be very high and no one knows the outcome, you know. How, how can China be sure that if there's a war, it will win the war? And uh, anyway, you know, the Taiwan issue is quite a uh, strong issue. If at all the Chinese go to war, it could be over Taiwan because that's a very, very emotive issue that is going to, you know, uh, increase the popularity of the party uh, without, you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, with the expectation that the China will win that war. But how can one be very sure? So, the uh, you know, uh, increase in military budget has always, you know, has been there, you know, earlier also so many years. Well, every few years they increase their military budget. Yes, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they talk uh, in that belligerent mood. But I think, uh, you know, they will think twice before, uh, you know, launching a war on anyone. This is my belief, but I don't know. If I'm proved wrong, I will accept that. And ma'am, how does it, uh, how does it uh, affect the nationalism? When the nationalism is fading, does, it, does both of them have an interrelation? You mean uh, talking about war and nationalism? Yes. yes well, uh, well uh, that is a divided opinion. You see, when you talk to Chin Chinese informally, especially to the intellectuals, university people and students, they say they don't want war at all with any country and they want, you know, the whole concept of uh, peaceful development or the peaceful rise of China to come back. In fact, in the early years of the Hu Jintao period, the peaceful rise theory was uh, uh, promoted. Now they don't talk about it because uh, at one point they did say that if, uh, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan tries to declare independence or does something uh, not, uh, uh, you know, which doesn't favor the Chinese, they may use non-peaceful methods. So that obviously means they will go to war. But again, I think this is more like public posturing. And the people, uh, there are people, it's like in our country also, there are people who at the drop of a hat say, you know, Pakistan ko ma khatam kar do, ladai karo, bomb phe ko Pakistan pe. You know, there are people like that in China also. Okay. So, uh, you know, who would probably believe that maybe something like that will uh, you know, enhance China's prestige. But average people, I don't think really want a war and uh, nationalism and war really that we don't go hand in hand. This is my belief from my, you know, experience of speaking to the Chinese. You know, again, I, you know, I, on this subject also, I've never done any, any, any research. I have taught Chinese history and politics in Delhi University. And it is from that, uh, you know, the readings I did that I, uh, you know, I agreed to speak here. You know, neither is nationalism my area nor is foreign policy my area. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just a small thing, ma'am. Uh, China, I was reading an article which mentioned that most of the 80% of the PLA army is made up of, it constitutes single child, single children who are so China can never ever want to go on a war. This is what I have. That's what yes, I want to yeah, That's an excellent point. I think thank you for thank you for sharing that. I think it's uh, very important. Uh, yes, Swaran, you've been wanting to speak. Thank you, Rina. I first of all want to say what a treat to hear uh, two very senior professors. Uh, very richly grounded in resources. Uh, I think that comes like extempore when they speak. Uh, I would recommend India should not have a retirement age. <laughs> uh, not that I'm a professor too. <clears throat> but it's a pleasure to listen to you know, people who have spent a lifetime studying these things. Uh, I want to draw uh, Professor Kamal Sheel, and I have two questions uh, uh, to ask him. One that, you know, his presentation had this constant uh, contestation between nationalism and modernity. And you gave examples for, uh, you mentioned uh, Liang Chi Chao, you mentioned the May 4th movement. Uh, so I understand that, that there was a certain contestation with European nationalism and European modernity. So my first question to Professor Kamal Sheed is, what was the version of Chinese conceptualization of modernity? And second, very related question to him is that of, uh, you know, for example, Thang, uh, cosmopolitanism, 
uh, all the way up to you know, Chungshan, uh, talking about five ethnicities uh, defining Chinese nationalism. So very culturally grounded. And why I'm asking this question is because you're grounded also physically in Kashi. And you see now increasing Indian narratives of defining cultural nationalism, just like Chinese have emphasized on cultural nationalism, which is inclusive of all and doesn't really emphasize too much on religion, but on ethnicity, on you know, geographies, geologies, stories, histories, and culture in that broader sense. Mm -hmm. So second question to you is, would you see a certain comparison in the narratives that are emerging both in Indian a sense of cultural nationalism and how the Chinese since ancient times have evolved. Now my question very quickly to Professor Srimati Chakshvarti uh, is, uh, I hope she can hear me uh, because her screen is frozen as far as I'm concerned. Professor Srimati? Yeah, I, I can hear you, yeah. I can hear my, you. My question to you here uh, is more contem contemporaneous narratives of nationalism, which we have seen, for example, you mentioned about Tang Xiaoping, talking about, you know, bide your time and hide your strengths, etc. and do not play leadership. So then moving on onwards to Chiang Zemin's spiritual civilization, Hu Chintao, harmonious society, to now narrative completely changing from sensory humiliation to national rejuvenation and the new era. So my question to you, has CCP, which you said does not need to exist and nationalism will still survive, has CCP over period of last 75 years, turned what I asked Kamal Shield about cultural nationalism into increasingly political nationalism. And that is what I think what would relate it to also war being an instrument. So has that transformation in 70 years occurred in your studies of, of China, that a cultural nationalism which is grounded in a history of 5,000 years, in 70 years is becoming increasingly political nationalism. Thank you, I look forward to hearing both of you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kamal Shil, would you like to take the floor first, please? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Swan has asked, you know, like certain basic questions which are very important and uh, very difficult to answer also. But uh, <clears throat> we have to think, like, as a historian, I see the problem from the perspective of late 19th century China. And the late 19th century China, there has been, you know, uh, like uh, various ideologies which uh, were, uh, which Chinese intellectuals, you know, adopted to make for the self strengthening of China. So after Opium War, you have, you know, self strengtheners and uh, other kind of, you know, um, ideologies which. Uh, uh, which is, you know, like uh, uh, termed as Ti Yung, you know, like uh, ideology, you know, where, you know, you have Chinese uh, character to what you are doing. So Confucianism, until Kang Yu Wei, you know, came to the sea, was considered to have, you know, answers for all the problems that China was facing. And Kang was one who tried to you know make Confucius modern by by you know inventing a new book by Confucius where he said that Confucius reform is uh, uh, possible within the Confucian system. So that you know led to uh, uh, the idea of you know uh, a system a modern system based on constitution and monarchy, to which, uh, uh, like which was promoted by Kang Yuwei. So the idea of nationalism was uh, an idea that was seen as, uh, uh, as the only way to bring China into the committee of nations, to make you know, China a nation state where its interests could be saved and continue. So nationalism and enlightenment in the Western you know, concept of nationalism are linked. We, nationalism started after the rejection of uh, say religious you know, legitimacy. So nationalism was kind of legitimacy 
that was used to uh, legitimize the work that nation and state does. So in the Western you know, concept of nationalism, modernity was you know, its integral part. And this modernity was based on the spirit of enlightenment. And that is why you know, capitalism and democracy were considered to be mm, the natural you know, extension of nationalism. So it was that kind of nationalism which appealed to you know, uh, China trying to challenge, trying to counter the West, and that became you know, a part of that. But once China became you know, strong, you know, and China mm, under the authoritarian you know, system of uh, communism, you know, it was not uh, able to uh, to you know attain the ideal of enlightenment, you know, which the Chinese people wanted. So the uh, democracy and uh, freedom or autonomy was always the issue after the establishment of the state. So every year, you know, during the May 4th time. Chinese state is you know, extra sensitive to the start of you know, any kind of movement. Because, and these movements uh, were you know, essentially to fulfill the task, which was, uh, which uh, say Chinese intellectuals had assigned to the state. So now, you know, now when China had become you know, strong and it has you know, more confidence, it, uh, uh, it is trying to develop its own, you know, uh, say, uh, ideology of nationalism and modernity. And that is where Kang Yu Wei and uh, uh, Chan Soren, you know, they come into picture. Kang Yu Wei, you know, now Confucianism is uh, one of the uh, buzzwords in the Chinese, you know, uh, soft diplomacy, you know, like. Uh, Every year there is a strong, <laughs> large, you know, uh, seminar uh, bringing together, you know, uh, scholars talking on Confucianism. Look, can one think of that, say, two decades or three decades earlier, of uh, such a blatant, you know, promotion of Confucianism? So we are seeing, you know, uh, a method through which a uh, state is trying to develop its own identity and its own uh, agenda for modernity. So we have to see uh, in contemporary China, like what are they borrowing from alternative discourses that uh, are taking place, uh, that took place during the May 4th time, and how are they you know, tuned? So that is, you know, uh, I think, uh, answer to your first question. For second question, you know, cultural language, it's a, it's a very, very, uh, say, loaded question, you know, in the present uh, scenario. Uh, loaded in the sense that, uh, uh, that political and cultural authorities, you know, should become congruent, you know. So, uh, such congruence, you know, would require, uh, like, would be a very difficult process. And it could happen only in an undefined future. It would be the, like, the state would strive to do that. Masses would strive to, you know, uh, bring politics uh, to culture or culture to politics. But uh, this is a process for which I don't see, you know, any time limit. You know, like uh, the process of growth of capitalism in China says uh, that it would bring, you know, communism and thing uh, over the time. So uh, it's a very difficult to, you know, must, uh, answer, uh, you know, this thing. So thank you. Uh, yes, we okay. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, just in a, I'll be very brief mm -hmm. uh, because I don't have much of an answer. Uh, whether cultural nationalism is giving way to uh, political nationalism, uh, it may still be a little early to say that for sure. 
you see trends in uh, uh, you know s sort of side tracking cultural nationalism and uh, promoting political nationalism started in the Huchintao period. And now, of course, we see they don't hardly talk about tradition. They don't talk about Japanese atrocities. They don't talk about, uh, uh, you know, the uh, humiliation that China faced. So it seems that uh, there is a tendency to move towards political nationalism. But of course, we have to wait for some time to be sure. Maybe we can have last uh, two or three questions. We have Dr. Chandar. Uh, uh, Bhushan uh, Nagar, uh, yes. So uh, you may kindly uh, be brief, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for the opportunity. Uh, my question is uh, for uh, Professor Srimati Chakravarti. Ma'am, uh, uh, actually, I just want to divert your uh, presentation just to an untouched area of the East Asia, and especially its impact over Northeast, since my area of interest is Northeast region. I would like to ask a question that uh, do you see the impact of Chinese nationalism specifically under the Maoist era had an impact over the Naga imbroglios like we have narration certainly you know stories like Naga groups in the decade of 60s and 70s they had traveled to Yunnan province to China through Myanmar in to obtain the certain military training and to obtain certain weapon to wage a war against the state of India. And the uh, second thing is that uh, we, we saw the rise of a Communist Party of Burma to be one of the largest uh, insurgent group who has you know, put up largest challenge to the state of Burma long back. Right now it is no more in existence, but uh, like uh, I feel that uh, there is an impact. I just want to know your views that how do you assess specifically the, the views of Maoism and its way of nationalism, uh, you know, how it relates to these two key studies, Northeastern regions with reference to Naga and uh, the Communist Party of Burma. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, you know, I'm glad you asked this question. This is what was happening at that time was hardly nationalism. It was more internationalism. As I said, you know, in the Maoist period, it was everything was in, uh, you know, um, Marxist and in this jargon, the Chinese believe that they have been assigned to spread revolution all over the world and they have to support uh, all the so called national liberation movements. It came out very strongly, you know, in 1965 when uh, strongly and openly in 1965 when Lin Piao wrote that essay, Long Live the Victory of People's War, where he said, you know, all the Chinese uh, revolutionary, uh, you know, the Chinese revolutionary model is very much applicable to countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And he had listed what, you know, he said base areas, you know, a People's Liberation Army, United Front politics, um, guerrilla tactics, all these things he had listed as things that, you know, will help in bringing the liberation of the whole world. So their support to Naga, uh, Nagas are later their support to the Naxalites, which was again, you know, more or less open support, was all for creating what they believed was you know world socialism that gradually one country after the other will fall into the hands of the um, communist parties the socialist parties and there will be world revolution and the state gradually will wither away you know that marxist dream and uh, so they were supporting uh, you know these movements so i don't know if it has to do with really nationalism in my opinion it has to do more with mao's you know internationalism that you bring the world together okay and therefore you know, support to so many insurgent groups. Now, you know, as you mentioned, Burma also, Southeast Asia, that resulted in strengthening, you know, strained relations between China and the rest of the world. During the Cultural Revolution, China had bad relations with every country, with the exception of uh, North Korea, Pakistan, and maybe Cuba, with every and Albania. Apart from these three or four countries, the relations with everybody had strained because they were calling for revolution all over the world. So it was more in the guise of internationalism rather than nationalism. Uh, so maybe we can take uh, two questions more. Uh, Megh Kalyana Sundaram, uh, are you there? Uh, yes. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, namaste to both the professors. Thank you so much for uh, an enlightening yes. discussion. Uh, my question is uh, to Professor uh, Chakrabarti, uh, specifically mm -hmm. because she mentioned the point about, uh, she mentioned a comparative point on America the US and China. I'd like to understand from her what she thinks about uh, Professor Mir Shima from University of Chicago and mm -hmm. uh, his position 
that, um, and I'm citing him uh, verbatim, it is that we are pursuing the American national interest in a real politic kind of a way and disguising our behavior with liberal rhetoric, unquote. So I'd like to kind of get your sense of uh, how do you see the Chinese nationalism um, as a response to American nationalism, which is perhaps not discussed as much. Um, yeah. Well, uh, actually, uh, much of Chinese nationalism now, you know, as we speak, today is a reaction to, you know, American nationalism. And this will continue uh, to sort of uh, increase, this uh, rhetoric will increase uh, till the US elections, because the United States, you know, will be using China, I mean, uh, sorry, not United States, President Trump will be using China to win the elections. That, you know, is already very clear. Now, uh, what is the quote? You know, I haven't read that uh, piece. What is the quote that you let said? Me, let me just read that out again. It is yeah, from uh, Professor John Mearsheimer. He teaches at uh, University of Chicago. Okay, and okay. Uh, his quote is, it is that we are pursuing the American national interest in a real politic kind of a way and mm. disguising our behavior with mm. liberal rhetoric. So, mm. so the question is more on this perceived liberalism being the solution for the whole world and how China is perhaps seeking to say that uh, this notion of liberalism need not be a universalist solution for all, it need not work. Why is that illegitimate if you see it as illegitimate? Yeah, yeah. that has been a debate for the last, uh, you know, 10, 12, 20 years, you know, the Chinese, uh, well, talked about their model, Chinese model, you know, not of revolution anymore, but of governance. And they think, you know, Xi Jinping is... Uh, you know, creating a new model of governance, which the rest of the world, especially the developing countries can follow. And in response, the America, of course, the rest of the world doesn't accept that. So uh, what this person is saying, you know, is more or less right, you know, like it's in the, um, you know, language of liberalism that uh, nationalism is being preached. And uh, there is no, uh, you know, sort of dispute or no oh. disagreement on that. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to know that. Thank uh, you. May we request Dr. Hem Kusum to ask your question from Shanti Niketan? I just, um, you know, so uh, what uh, sense I get is that nationalism has always been a very homogeneous concept in China. Is it like that? I mean, um, uh, uh, like we have concept of, uh, you know, uh, India, like, you know, uh, 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 we have divergent views on it. So um, uh, have we ever seen something like this in China where, uh, there are divergent views on China among people that, okay, fine, my brand of nationalism is better than yours or something like that. Thank you. Well, uh, probably, uh, you know, Alpana is in a better position to answer that, but I doubt that will be allowed in China because the moment, you know, there is the standard, uh, you know, uh, view on nationalism uh, is actually supported by the state and it, you know, starts with the, the Communist Party's view on nationalism and that has to be accepted by everybody in a you know in, in different degrees. So an alternative view of nationalism uh, may not be you know approved by the uh, rulers. And uh, you know I, I can't say you know I've not uh, been through social media that well. Alpana may be able to say that, but I I don't know. I'm not really competent to answer that question. I see Professor Swaran Singh you know raising his hand. He may be able to raise his hand as well. Uh, we have <laughs> Professor Han who are with us. Uh, if Professor Swaran Singh, you would. Allow me to check with her if she would like to ask a question. Uh, in fact, on 3rd of June, she would be, uh, you know, our key speaker for uh, the webinar for our fourth session. Uh, may I request Professor Hanhua? You're, I could see you, but... I have uh, fully in the, the presentations and also the Q&A session, and I found it's very useful for me to understand how Indian's perspective on the Chinese nationalism. But uh, how to say, could I put the other way around? Um, compare, uh, I want to have a comparison uh, between Chinese nationalism and also Indian nationalism. And uh, especially when we talk about uh, Chinese nationalism, uh, what uh, something different characteristics or figures 
uh, the two uh, distinguished speakers uh, can really help me out uh, to, to do a little bit of comparison work. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Swaran Singh, and then we'll go back to our uh, speakers for their last uh, one minute each intervention before we conclude today's, because I think we are already 20 minutes um, ahead of our schedule. Yeah. Uh, Professor Swaran Singh, to you. It's, it's not my day of speaking. I only wanted to once again nudge uh, the Professor Kamal Sheel. If he would like to answer that question that uh, Hem Kusum was asking about is there any homogeneous imagination? And because before the Communist Party came in, even we go back to 1921, but since you're looking at 19th century, was there a homogeneous uh, imagination of nationalism? Because you know both of us are talking about cultural nationalism here. And I think Han Hua's question also is very closely related to what I was asking you. Then if that is a homogeneous imagination of cultural nationalism in 19th century, if not now. Uh, is that something similar to what India's narrative is beginning to direct us towards? Sir, uh, am I audible? Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think, you know, it's a very, uh, very difficult to say that there is a homogeneous nationalism. Nationalism is not something, you know, coded or something, you know, which have been defined, you know, a priori before any action. Nationalism is always constructed. And in the 19th century, when China was shifting from a civilizational state to nation state because of the pressure from the imperialist forces, that it had to define a certain you know, key parameter on which they would like to build a modern nation state, which could be accepted in the Committee of Nations. And in course of that, they found the Western model, you know, the, they means, you know, the majority of intellectuals, you know, during the May 4th. And the May 4th was the period when, uh, you know, imperialist forces had rejected, you know, uh, Chinese demand for uh, being treated as, you know, equal. That a particular form of nationalism kind of emerges. So imaginaries of nationalism are something, you know, which and uh, uh, it, it was supposed to take, uh, uh, make the country, you know, strong in the period when there were, you know, crises. So if we see nationalism as a construct uh, in different, you know, historical periods, we may understand, you know, it's a uh, uh, basis. And uh, we can say that how from the Nehru's period to present period, you know, the idea of nationalism has so much changed, you know, from a secular to a cultural. Uh, it is something uh, uh, that for a historian, you know, that is, you know, something which, uh, uh, which is strike. And then also, the idea of nationalism that is invented or imagined is always based on historical experiences, connections, networks, you know. So we have to keep, you know, all this in mind when we talk about, you know, nationalism. And when we say about, you know... Uh, thank you. So, Professor Srimati, would you like to say any concluding remarks or...? Well, not much, except that I entirely agree with the, the assessment of uh, Professor Kamal Shield that uh, you cannot really decide what, uh, you know, what comprises nationalism. It changes with time, it changes with place. So, uh, like, it's that way, you know, it's very different from an ideology, which is much more fixed. And in case of China, it is absolutely clear that ideology is now completely sidetracked. It is nationalism. And uh, with, in the next few months, we may see, you know, more of this Belgian nationalism. And, uh, you know, especially, you know, as long as this uh, uh, attacks on China continue in, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the uh, COVID uh, crisis. 
So uh, that is likely to happen, but uh, maybe eventually things may get a little uh, moderate. This is what I believe. I was not wrong, wrong to predict the future, but this is my feeling that in the next several months, there will be an upsurge of nationalist sentiments in China and there will be a moderation in the later period. Let's, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. You presented uh, such a wonderful uh, detailed account of uh, how China's nationalism has changed over time. And Professor Kamal Shield has also, uh, you know, spoken about it in great detail and uh, how China once has moved to modernity and uh, to be a member of the Committee of Nations historically. Uh, and how, of course, uh, today it is challenging uh, uh, you know, uh, so many countries, the world over and the world order as it exists. Uh, so I think we've had brilliant uh, two speakers today and uh, several questions. So I'll request Professor Swaran Singh uh, to give the formal vote of thanks. And yes, thank you, Swaran. It's a pleasure to be part of uh, such a discussion. Uh, two of my very dear senior colleagues and very, very competent people on the subject. Uh, I had great anticipation, but they have really crossed that anticipation by the presentation being very academically grounded. And that is the whole purpose of this particular Wednesday webinar. We don't want to do any splash kind of uh, public relations exercise. This is aimed at intense academic uh, presentations. And I'm happy to see that all three the webinars uh, that we have had we have usually crossed 30 minutes beyond our assigned time. And I can still again today see 51 people are still with us. And that's a great endorsement and support uh, that we receive from all our friends. In fact, it's an opportunity to meet the friends uh, much more easily. And then know more people who are uh, working in the field much more easily. So in some sense, it's a better attendance than one usually sees uh, in physical meetings that they used to have. So in some sense, maybe there's an advantage of going into the cyberspace and talking to each other online from the comforts of your homes with your own coffee and biscuits. Uh, no financial <laughs> issues for the organizers in that case. So I deeply appreciate your indulgence, uh, all people who are staying with us. And uh, as I repeatedly say, it is because of you that we will continue to do such an intense academic discussion every Wednesday. Uh, but of course, uh, the special thanks would go today to uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Professor Kamal Shiel and uh, Professor Srimati Chakravarti, to you know, sort of fine tune their uh, thinking on this particular theme, structure it, and present it uh, to us in a, in a very, very lucid fashion and keeping still you know, grounded in deep academic tradition that I think uh, I dare say even sometimes looks like disappearing in age of social media now. I think that is, that is a generation of scholars that we deeply will remember and admire. And then I think we should learn from them as to how to really do a serious uh, job of uh, what one is uh, researching into. But last not not the least also, let me also thank my colleague who beautifully steered, steered this uh, session today, uh, to Professor Rina Marwa. And of course, we look forward to you on next Wednesday. You saw briefly, as we say, we had a guest appearance from Professor Han Hua uh, from uh, the famous Beijing University. She's our next speaker on the coming Wednesday. So we will look at how she explains to us whether COVID-19 which may catapult nationalism issue as well, has uh, put Beijing on siege. That is the title she's giving, whether Beijing is on siege because of this enormous uh, global response to its origins in Wuhan. So I hope most of you will uh, again join us on next Wednesday. And with that, I take your leave and say thank you very much to all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kamal Shil. Thank, thank you, Professor Srimati. Thank you. A big thank, thank you to each one. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for staying with us for two hours <laughs> and more. <laughs> Many of you joined before 11 yeah. Today we had yeah. <laughs> 30, 40. It was really yeah, great pleasure to interact with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Long time that. Uh, after retirement that I'm talking about China. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but, but you yeah, it's been yeah, yeah. Brilliantly, yeah, right. you know, because yeah, yeah, your yeah, publications, but, yeah. your work, yeah. your 
scholarship says it all. <laughs> Thank you. And good to meet both of you, you know, after see both of you <laughs> after yes. a long time, at the ele electronically. <laughs> yes. And now I'm glad yeah. you're accustomed yeah. to Zoom and quite well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, like, I feel a little confident in the webinar. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe, maybe Professor Kamal Shield and Professor Sumati Chakravarti next Wednesday also. Yeah. Again, is a very China-centric uh, discussion. Yeah. And we're going to have soon, uh, you know, moving to other parts of the planet. We'll have yeah. speakers from the other side of the hemisphere soon. And I think in that case, we'll also perhaps shift time to 5.30 because we have to accommodate, uh, you know, it's being night uh, when we speak at 11.30 in the US and, and that part. So maybe you will notice that, you know, sometime we'll be changing time to 5.30, but usually our standard time will stay at 11.30 on Wednesdays. We will uh, share the report of this session by Friday or Thursday evening. Uh, our research team is uh, excellent. So they, it will be on Facebook. It's on Twitter. Uh, the also Association of Asia Scholars page uh, is very much alive. Our website. Uh, so please do join us. Yeah. And stay in Let, touch. Let lecture will also be soon on youtube so if any yes. of your friends are asking that you missed it i am getting some messages here that people are not able to join us we will let them know that there is a you know recording that we will be uploading on youtube soon so they can yes. access it in people yes. 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 yes.